Thank you, Ellis. Thank you, Ellis. Um, good evening. Welcome to the, the fog of war. It seems particularly sort of difficult today, and, and we won't dwell on that, although it might impact on, on, on the evening in various ways. So, so my name is Robert Marr. I'm a professor of architecture in the UK and Sweden. Um, and I suppose my involvement in the Harkiv School started in 2016-17 when the school was founded, and I have followed it um, since. And it's been an inspiring story, and of course was particularly distressed to hear its difficulties when the war broke out. This event tonight brings together four cities that are, have, experienced conflict. Beirut, Sarajevo, Belfast, and Kharkiv. Very different conflicts with different causes, with different protagonists, and very different timescales. But against this diversity and against this difference, they have much in common. And this event is a very gentle way of sharing experiences, identifying good practice in relation to education, architecture, governance, and reconstruction. But above all, simply a way of providing friendship, support and ongoing solidarity. The newest and most urgent situation is that faced by our friends and colleagues from Harkiv, represented tonight by the leadership of the School of Architecture and by one of their students who will join us later. Unfortunately, events in the last 36 hours and visa issues have meant that Irena, Daria, Oleg, cannot be with us in person and will join us via Zoom. And given the circumstances today, please be patient if at any point their connection breaks, there's a power cut, or they are forced to take shelter. The school will be introduced properly in a moment, but just a few words from my perspective about why the school is so special. It is an independent school located in a fiercely independent city. It is part of an archipelago of small, independent architecture schools linked to specific contexts, schools that question orthodoxy, drive change, and shape their local identity. As such, the school's survival is essential not just to Ukraine, but I think to us all. Following the invasion and the start of the war, the school relocated temporarily to Lviv in western Ukraine and is now back up and running attracting its students back and setting up new courses for next year. In parallel, the school is part of the formation of Roskvit, the Urban Alliance for Ukraine, that is leading the way in shaping the conversation about the future of Ukrainian cities. Issues like resisting colonization through reconstruction and ensuring Ukrainian cities are exemplars for us all of sustainable urbanism. As they put it, correcting the mistakes of the past. Whilst it's important that school is up and running, its economy remains very fragile, and it continues to need practical and financial support. So we are totally unashamed in asking for your help in supporting the school. And you will find a flyer on your seats, and also Vera Leonova, who is the school's representative in London. Here, stand up, <laughs> please will be available to talk to you afterwards if you have ideas as to how you might help. So this evening obviously is structured around a series of presentations relating to each city. And I will give a brief introduction to those speakers in a sec. But first, before we do that, and before we go into the city presentations, Irena Matsevko, who is the vice chancellor of the school, will say something about the school's context and the very, very particular situation of Kharkiv, remembering that this is a conversation around the city scale and different cities and how they respond to reconstruction and education during and after war. Then there will be four city presentations. Hiba Buakar will talk about Beirut. Hiba is assistant professor in urban planning program at Columbia, where she leads the post-conflict cities lab. Hiba co-edited Narrating Beirut from its Borderlands and is author of For the War Yet to Come, Planning Beirut's Frontiers. Then Vernes Kalsevich and Lucy Dinan will spoke, talk about Sarajevo and Bosnia-Herzegovina more generally. 
Furness and Lucy are architects living and working in Sarajevo. They are architects of the prize-winning Most Mira Peace Centre in Pliador and teach in Bosnia and at Sheffield and are part of something I'm involved in, which is the Global Free Unit. Mark Hackett will speak about Belfast. Mark is an architect in practice working on the urban issues of Belfast. He was a founder of the Forum for Alternative Belfast and a founding partner in Hackett Hall McKnight, which has completed a number of wonderful projects, including the award-winning buildings for the Arts Centre in Belfast. Then we will return to Irena, who will be joined by Daria, and they will talk about Kharkiv and their educational and urban agenda. Irena is Deputy Vice-Chancellor, and Daria is Architecture Programme Director. Irena is, a, Irena is a historian and researcher, and Daria is an architect and co-founder of Noama Studio. We will then move to discussion, and that will be begun by Robert Bevan. Robert is an award-winning journalist, author, and heritage consultant, and architectural critic for the Evening Standard. Robert is author of The Destruction of Memory, and his latest book, Monumental Lies, Culture and the Truth About the Past, comes out today. He's not going to sell it, but it's, he's here today, so thank you. We will also be joined by Maria, who is one of the students who is here in London from Kharkiv for that conversation. So finally, you will already have sensed that this is a vast subject area. And I think today what we will be doing is simply sort of opening the box and looking forward to further conversations. And I'm very pleased to say that Ellis and the Architecture Foundation have agreed to host a series of further online debates that spin out of tonight's events and look at specific cities in detail. So thank you, Ellis. Thank you, Architecture Foundation. And of course, thank you to Barbican Centre for, for hosting the events. So may I now ask Irina to say a few words about the school and Kharkiv. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert, for introduction. Thank you very much for inviting us for, for this event. Despite of any obstacles, we are here with you and we are very happy to be with you um, uh, today. Um, I would like to, uh, uh, to begin this event with a focus on Kharkiv, actually. And then in our presentation, we will link it in, with, uh, with the school, our mission and uh, our work. Why this is so important? Because uh, unfortunately, uh, Kharkiv is a very important city for Ukraine and for even post-Soviet uh, um, uh, area. But unfortunately, it's not... Uh, known abroad and it's very sad story that now Kharkiv become, become one of the most uh, known city the name of the city is on the, all uh, a newspaper. So, and it's very important to, to know more about the city, to understand uh, its context, uh, its uh, challenges, uh, to start to talk about uh, uh, recon reconstruction um, uh, after after the war. Uh, so. I would like to, to give you a short introduction of Kharkiv, uh, the city where school was founded and uh, the city with which uh, school is uh, strongly identified itself. Turning from a borderland city to a frontline uh, city, Kharkiv now has become a symbol of resistance to the aggression of Russia, which uh, uh, continuously to shell it every, every day. Kharkiv is the second last city in uh, Ukraine, populated with uh, one and a half million of people. It located, uh, it located 30 kilometers uh, um, uh, away from Russian border. It is a city which with rich heritage and great uh, story of uh, uh, history of uh, success stories. As a part of Russian empire, Kharkiv was an important economic and educational center located on the north-south axis of empire. Later, Kharkiv became the first, cap first capital of the Soviet Ukraine. The Bolshevik invested uh, uh, not only substantial funds uh, to the city, but also vast intellectual resources. As a result, Kharkiv has grown in the architectural capital of modernism. Kharkiv constructivism is well known uh, 
around the architectural world, it became a very important uh, educational and research center, not only for Soviet Ukraine, but also Soviet Union. Uh, at the end of the Soviet Union, uh, Kharkiv has uh, more than 20 research institutions and 22 educational, high educational institutions. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, Kharkiv uh, promptly adjusted itself to the um, market economy and became prosperity uh, business center. So Kharkiv's uh, identity is uh, uh, largely shaped by its uh, uh, borderland location and uh, proximity uh, to Russia. The relations between uh, Russian Empire and later Soviet uh, Union and uh, um, Kharkiv uh, were developed as relation, relations between the empire and colony, the center and uh, periphery. And the pro-Russian bias of the city was shaped for centuries of Russian colonial culture policy uh, by family relations spread across the border and after the collapse of the Soviet Union by joint business uh, partnership and even assets. Such close relation, relation with Russian in, uh, with Russian affected local um, policies and practices. As uh, like uh, Russian city, cities, Kharkiv was a place uh, with a strong authoritarian hierarchy of uh, local authority with uh, a quite paternalistic uh, community. Corruption and uh, non-transparent uh, um, relation between local authority and uh, city actors, and the revolution of dignity, and the war uh, Russia started uh, um, against uh, Ukraine in 2014, became a quite challenge for the city. But in the same time, it became a first step towards, towards destruction of a strong colonial legacy of the city. In the period of 2015 and 2022 become the time to search for a new identity for the city and its new place in the post-revolutionary Ukraine. And the fact that city has now welcome, has not welcomed uh, Russian troops and is still uh, standing fast against uh, um, them suggested a profound transformations and uh, weakening of the colonial um, uh, mindset of local community and authority. So nevertheless, the, tr this uh, transition status of the city would definitely influence the process of city um, recovery and international actors of uh, recovery process should be aware of, of it to avoid mistakes that took place in Sarajevo, Beirut and other big uh, post-conflict city. And I hope that today we can share, share our thoughts mm -hmm. Uh, and other experience uh, uh, in the process of uh, recovering such big cities uh, um, as Kharkiv. Thank you. Thank you, Irina. Iba, may I introduce you again? Um. Iba Buakov is going to speak about Beirut. This um, telephone is the only way they can see us, so apologies for that. Can you hear me? And I want to first thank um, Robert Mal and the Architecture Foundation for inviting, organizing, and hosting uh, us here. Um, my heart goes out to my Ukrainian colleagues. Uh, for someone who grew up in Beirut, lived through war, and worked on war, I really feel what they're going through. So um, I hope that will be the, the end of wars. We will ha we'll have an end to war in the world at some point in our lives. Uh, so tonight I will speak about Beirut. Uh, for decades now, the name Beirut has been synonymous with war, chaos, and violence. From 1975 to 1990, the city was the epicenter of the long Lebanese civil war. That conflict resulted in massive property destruction. 
at least 120,000 people, some people put the number at 200,000 people, were killed, and one million people were internally displaced. <coughs> on the eve of the Lebanese Civil War in 1975, tensions has es had escalated on a range of issues, including nationalism, pan-Arabism, armed presence, uneven development, and poverty. There were thus many origin stories and phases of the Civil War, at least four, and the nature of the war also changed over time to reflect the many regional and international interventions and shifting local alliances, eventually becoming, as it's mostly commonly as understood, a sectarian battle or a civil war between Christian, Shia, Sunni, and Druze militias in Lebanon. During the first two years of war, let's call it phase one, Beirut was divided between a Christian East and a Muslim West along what became known as the Green Line. This agreement, this segregation came as a result of sectarian cleansing that resulted in mass displacements, forcing people to flee their homes in mixed areas to seek refuge in areas under the control of militias corresponding to their sectarian affiliation. At the same time, thousands of, of Shia families were fleeing the violence of the Lebanese-Israeli border and the eventual Israeli occupation of South Lebanon. Families arriving from the South sought refuge in abandoned apartments along the Green Line, areas that were heavily shelled during the first year of the war and abandoned by the original owners before destruction moved to other parts of the city. So families squatted and built homes inside the destroyed buildings. As you can see here, the more recent concrete built uh, to close the cavities that were caused by war to, uh, for, for people to, able, to be able to survive in, this, uh, in these buildings. So families squatted and built homes inside the destroyed buildings, as, um, as uh, some of these images show. And many of them lived under these conditions for more than 25 years before the reconstruction project pushed them out. You can see all of the uh, more recent countries inside the destroyed buildings. In, the in 1989, the warring factions finally reached an agreement to end the fighting. Among other provisions, it institutionalized the sectarian-based power sharing allowing the militias that had fought the war to become religious political organizations overnight. And so to basically they became the rulers of Lebanon in post-war. Soon after the reconstruction of downtown Beirut was to begin, along with attempts to resolve the mass displacement caused by the civil war. Key to this after war displacement were the privatization policies of the government. In particular, in 1992, the government made the controversial decision to award the reconstruction of downtown Beirut to, the pri to a private real estate company, development company, commonly known as Solidaire. Solidaire, as you can see here, was just a small area compared to the destruction that Beirut endured along the Green Line and elsewhere in the city. And so the company basically worked on a master plan of the area that included the expansion and the development of a ring road that dissected the city's downtown from its immediate context and the areas around it. The company's slogan was and is still Beirut, an Asian city for the future, attempting to rebuild the city by focusing mostly and specifically on its French colonial and Ottoman heritage rather than the more, re more, more recent or pre-war urbanization of the area. Separating the city from the immediate context, the reconstruction project doubled down on the violence of war and continued the segregation and erasure that the war had started. So it's, uh, erasure through reconstruction, reconstruction rather than destruction. This is the ring road that separates the, the downtown Solidaire project from the rest of the city. As the reconstruction of Beirut city center began and ruined structures began to be cleared to make way for new reconstruction, a familiar debate on war, ruins, and reconstructions emerged. Who constructs? What do you reconstruct? Which and whose memory do you reconstruct? What are you choosing to erase? Which vision is implemented? Whose vision is implemented? Some writers and urbanists argued for the importance of retaining some of the ruins to preserve the memory of war. If the Lebanese population were to forget this part of their history, the argument went, they would repeat it. They were bolstered in this view by studies and examples that have used war memorials, especially after World War II in Europe, as a form of peace education. However, this position was ultimately no match for the potential of new real estate development in the wake of war. 
And except in few notable cases, what you see on the, uh, you see the Barakat building on the screen, a bullet hole building that has been transformed into a museum and a cultural center that documents Beirut's history and its civil war, or the iconic Holiday Inn, for those of you who are familiar with it, the logic of future war profit prevailed over one of preservation, memory, and the past. So here are some of the images from uh, Solidaire's reconstruction project. And as some scholars have marked, more buildings, and I quote, more buildings were torn down in the city centers during reconstruction than during the war itself. And as bulldozers brought down the ruins, Beirut's skyline began to sprout a glittering crop of new concrete, stone, and glass towers. This was, in turn, accompanied by a decision to evict war displaced families from the city center. Such policies were all part of the government's agenda of new liberal economic restructuring that the government had to implement as it basically needed foreign investment, monetary aid for reconstruction, loans, and basically lots of foreign money, and reflected its desire to redevelop the, city, the city, central city as an area for business, tourism, upscale housing, and foreigners, in, um, mostly from the Gulf. The decision to privatize reconstruction of downtown Beirut was accompanied with the decision to give war displaced families and populations monetary compensation to evacuate the ruined buildings they had occupied as quarters instead of devising a comprehensive relief plan, reconstruction plan. The government's stated purpose of the monetary compensation was to support families to return to their home villages in South Lebanon, homes that they have left 20, 30 years before. So for them, for many of these people, Beirut was home. Moving the problem elsewhere, the periphery, many of the families evicted from makeshift housing by the reconstruction of downtown Beirut and other major infrastructure projects were forced to look for alternative affordable housing on the fringes of the city. And the city itself was prohibitively, and still is, prohibitively expensive with no low-cost housing options. The combinations of their evictions and the government's monetary settlements created an overwhelming demand for new housing in the city's southern peripheries. They eventually bought apartments in Beirut's southern peripheries like areas in Sahra Shwaifet, in housing projects like this, the AA complex, where I've done research for a long time. Many of the housing complexes like this were constructed by developers who were affiliated to religious political organizations, and they were part of the sectarian regime. These actors dominated the housing and real estate markets. They also dominated the master planning and zoning of the peripheries. They were also the main brokers on how much compensation um, uh, compensation money families received, since these actors function inside the government and outside it. They're the government and they're also non-governmental organizations at the same time, which created pattern-client relationships between families looking for housing and those religious uh, political organizations who had become special actors. Transforming the periphery into frontier, the role of religious political organizations in shaping space transformed these peripheries, peri Beirut's peripheries basically, into frontiers using urban planning and architecture tools. So for example, just quickly, I'm not gonna talk much about it, but you can see that transformation of zoning of Sahra Shwaifet, red is industrial, green and blue is residential, between 1996 and 2008, basically changing rapidly depending on the alliances that they were forging or the battles they were having between each other. New cycles of war emerged every time these organizations fought battles. Some came close to many civil walls, like into, many civil battles, like in 2008. It also created environmental disasters that caused new forms of displacement along class lines. Thus, while these areas may provide affordable housing for low-income and middle-income populations who could not otherwise of, uh, af afford to reside in the city, these peripheries also became zones of conflict and contestation, frontiers, basically, where the fear of future local and regional violence actively shaped both the lived present and the imagined futures of, uh, uh, of the built environment. In my book, I argued that this transformation of peripheries into frontiers in Beirut could be understood through the spatial and temporal logic of the war yet to come. The war yet to come does not treat war and peace as distinct categories, as much as we want to think of them as such. It doesn't approach war as a temporal aberration in a linear time of progress with a beginning and an end. Rather, it focuses on how war, violence, and their continuous anticipation have shaped Beirut's segregated geographies. The future of the war yet to come is uncertain and volatile, mostly imagined to be bleak, and this affects how geographies and their futures are being shaped, contested, and negotiated. This yet to of conflict could be a war, but could also be economic crisis 
could be climate disasters and or a port explosion like we saw happen two years ago in Lebanon, which I'm sure you saw all on your screens. And in February 2022, while thinking about the foreclosed futures of post-war cities like Beirut, as Lebanon's currency lost 90% of its value, with 25% of the Lebanese population, the residents of Lebanon as uh, mostly Syrian refugees, and with more than 60% of re uh, uh, residents currently under poverty line, 60% or more, and with new marks of disaster marking its buildings, walls, landscapes, and images of, the images of destruction of Ukrainian cities by the Russian armies and Russian invasion, and the displacement of its residents starting beaming on our TV screens, and debates were spurred in our living rooms around the uncertainties about the future of a third world war or a nuclear war yet to come, and the, and the future of Ukrainian uh, cities and their people. In every social setting for me, around, for example, around me in New York, there was this repeated questions. Is this the beginning of World War III? Is a nuclear war coming? Where is safe? What shall we do? Regardless of whether the answer will be a yes or a no, hopefully it's, it's always a no for war, what is important is how invoking these questions about the future have major repercussions on the socioeconomic and political territorial organizations of our present. So how do we understand processes of urbanization and reconstruction that are shaped by imagined futures of global crisis, while also rebuilding and educating future architects and planners on how to rebuild destroyed cities like Kharkiv using the tools of architecture and planning with the intention of transforming social engagement and stimulating new imaginings of futures beyond that of ongoing war and crisis. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Hiba. Um, Vanessa and Lucy to talk about Sarajevo. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? You're too tall. Okay. Uh, we're honored to be here and to support the Kharkiv School of Architecture in any way we can, who we're very inspired by, and I'm sure that all of you are too. My name is Vernes. I was born in Sarajevo and raised in the siege of Sarajevo before becoming a refugee in the UK. Qualified as an architect and worked in London before moving back to Sarajevo, where I've been dedicated my work to post-war reconstruction and peace building. Uh, hi, my name is Lucy. I'm an architect from London, but we've together been living and working in Sarajevo for the past six years, where we run our studio, Project Beat Architecture, and we also teach in Bosnia at the University of Sheffield and the Global Free Unit. Tonight, we'd like to bring up three challenges to post-war reconstruction in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is still recovering from the Bosnian War of 92 to 5. And these are return, resilience, and reconciliation. The process of return has been an epic failure in Bosnia. The socialist uh, Yugoslavia was made up of 60 centralized republics. Bosnia and Herzegovina was the most ethnically mixed republic. This pre-war map shows a heterogeneous mix of Bosnian Muslims, Bosnian Croats, and Bosnian Serbs. The war resulted in over 100,000 deaths and half the country's population was displaced. The Dayton Peace Agreement divided people along ethnic lines creating two political entities and a complicated tripartite government. In 2010, I decided to return to Bosnia. For me, sustainable return is a catalyst for sustainable reconstruction, but there are many obstacles. Annex 7 of the Dayton Peace Agreement gives a legal right for those displaced by the war to return to their homes of origin. However, there are some key things missing. One of these is the definition of home. Bosnia's ministry built standardized houses with imported materials and no insulation. These are not the homes that people built with their own hands before the war. Rebuilding home means rebuilding identity, culture, community, and place. Secondly, there's no provision of sustainable return. 20 years since the war, and many returnees still live off-grid, some in hum uh, dehumanizing temporary collective shelters. The only public buildings being built, rebuilt are administrative and religious buildings. No communal infrastructure and unemployment furthers ethnic divisions. 
And thirdly, people. Reconstruction should play a key role in rebuilding people. Architects cannot underestimate the importance of embodied knowledge and lived experience in reconstruction. Srebrenica was a UN safe zone during the genocide of over 8,000 Bosnian Muslims. Over half the population was forcefully displaced and the town was destroyed. Working on sustainable return in places like Srebrenica requires a uniquely sensitive approach. Architects need to bring together politicians, academics and NGOs with refugees, IDPs and returnees on the ground. Traverse our own displacement, return and identity to work on the sustainable return of others. Design moral contracts and build trust with people and places. And develop architectural devices to work intimately with returnees and displaced people. To reconstruct memory and to analyse the destroyed communal and industrial facilities. This notice board is a piece of architecture, which we use for community planning workshops, but also to reconnect people with Srebrenica's material history of metalworking. Sustainable return centres around protecting memory and building resilience, while giving a third life to destroyed social, industrial and economic infrastructure. However, without state support, it's left to people to create their own returns, as expressed in this self-build returnee house. But we can learn a lot from the returnee who built a grave for the rubble of his home in a town where memorials are prohibited. And rather than returning, on average, 50,000 Bosnians have continued to leave the country each year. So our second, <coughs> me, our second challenge is resilience. During the siege of Sarajevo, on average, 329 shells per day hit the city, destroying and damaging more than 65% of the, of the buildings and 80% of the infrastructure. This was herbicide, and it included the intentional targeting of cultural monuments. For example, the shelling of the town hall, which housed the National Library, and resulted in the burning of almost 2 million books. There are perhaps four broad themes to consider here. Firstly, the centre versus the periphery. So this considers the disparities between the authorities creating the image of reconstruction, as we see here, through the symbolic rebuilding of iconic public and administrative build buildings, versus the lack of actual ground level reconstruction for ordinary communities, uh, like updating heating systems, waste infrastructure and transport. Secondly, memorialization and neglect. Commemorating the victims of this war whilst not neglecting the shared heritage from the past, such as the anti-fascist monuments and museums built after World War II. Thirdly, corruption and unregulated development. Although so over $5 billion was raised for Bosnia's reconstruction between 1996 and 2002, much of the city was left to decay. In many cases, this has led to short-sighted and unregulated development of commercial, religious and empty residential buildings by foreign investment, unsuitable for the scale of the city, the climate or the population. So lastly, I'll focus on resilience and missed opportunities. For us, the key to long-term resilience lies with understanding place-specific reconstruction, respecting the layered narratives of the city, while understanding and predicting what challenges may face it in the future, including perpetual uncertainty. We run two projects which explore resilience as part of both a current and a future reconstruction specific to Sarajevo. The first is living memorials, developing new forms of memorialization as continual investigations into the memory of the city. Uh, three examples of this. So firstly, this is the forensic investigation and conservation plans for the neglected former Museum of the Revolution. Secondly, a digital archive and film of 3D scanned sites which records the ongoing occupations of important spaces in the city as digital memorials. And lastly, modelling sites of atrocities and herbicide from the siege for ongoing investigations and for public exhibitions around social justice. The next project is Resilient Futures. The legacy of conflict and corruption, outdated systems and unplanned settlements have led to perpetual crises. For example, Bosnia has the fifth highest mortality rate for air pollution in the world. We learn from the siege, which alongside violence and destruction, gave rise to extraordinary precedents of how citizens and architects overcame scarcity by inventing resourceful and transient tools and architectures for survival. We teach this as a master's design studio at the Sheffield School of Architecture and to create new forms of urban resilience for current and future social and environmental problems. The most difficult challenges to peace in Bosnia 
are located in the rural returning communities. Due to the lack of will by politicians, the bulk of this reconciliation work falls to grassroots organisations. Most Mira are a peace-building charity working at the local community level in Priedor in the Republika Srpska entity. In 1992, the charity's founder and other Bosnian Muslims from the village of Kevljani were rounded up at this local playing field, which was once a gathering space shared with a Bosnian Serb village. From here, they were taken to the Omarska concentration camp, where hundreds were killed. Around 60,000 Bosnians were forced to leave Priedor in the war, which was half the town. Since the war, returnees face many challenges. There are lack of jobs, partly due to discrimination and privatisation and closure of large worker-owned factories. The Omarska mine is now owned by the global steel giant ArcelorMittal, while building permanent memorials for the Bosnian victims of Omarska and Priyadar is still prohibited. And communities remain divided along ethnic lines. This has a dangerous effect on young people they attend ethnically segregated schools where they learn different versions of history and have no shared space to meet each other. 56 schools across the country are classified as two schools under one roof where children are physically divided by walls and fences. Since 2009, Mosmida have been transforming this symbolic playing field in Kevliani and an adjoining ruined house into a positive and safe space for community building bringing together thousands of young people from all ethnic backgrounds to participate in festivals and creative peace-building programs. And since 2014, we've been working with Moss Mila on our prize-winning Rammed Earth Peace Centre project. A peace centre is much more than a building. We've developed the project through a community-based workshop program called Architecture for Peace. We bring together Bosnian students and residents from across ethnic divides as well as international students to participate in the project's development. The centre will be built using locally sourced earth and other sustainable materials, working with international experts through a series of on-site peace building workshops. We're bringing together the community around reinventing a shared local tradition of building with earth, while also creating training opportunities and new circular economies for peace. And this summer, we expanded this education program to start exploring small-scale architectural interventions in the divided landscape around the centre to repair social and ecological relationships in the wider community and beyond. This type of work is more pressing than ever. In a continent with over 40 separatist movements, we must learn that if we're not always building peace, then we're continuously sleepwalking into war. Thank you. We're now going to move um, to an online contribution from Mark Hackett, I hope, speaking from Belfast. Thanks. Mark. Here are the screens. That's the image is coming up. Hello, Mark Hackett from Belfast. Um, I wanted to talk today a, a bit in a kind of sideways way of looking at the Belfast experience, we called it layers, masks, and the mundane. And I suppose it comes up in some of the other discussions that often the biggest impacts on, on average people are the mundane effects on their life and their neighborhoods. And it's not the it's not the, the more obvious signs of conflict that are actually the ones that have the biggest impact. Um, the Northern Irish conflict, you know, I put up some words and names, we can't even agree about terminology, but it was notionally a, a a question of identity did you feel yourself to be british or irish or protestant or catholic or as i say no or both which is what the good friday agreement came to if people could say they were neither religion or both uh, nationalities is it a troubles was it a conflict or a war it, it did go on for around 25 years and was relatively low level and long and uh, it then has had 25 years of the peace process since uh, so it's not a perfect peace it's a kind of ongoing process there's kind of many more protagonists than, than is generally recognized. So just to start looking at that idea of layers and masks, it even starts at the political level of, you know, what, what is the conflict and what is it really about? Um, Northern Ireland is a place where the religions 
and, and identities were always separated to some extent through the countryside areas, each town, village, and also obviously in Belfast. Belfast is known for having, you know, almost 80 or 90 peace walls between Catholic and Protestant areas, but by and large, most people won't see those day to day unless you actually live in those neighborhoods. Most of them are hidden from view. Most of them are quite small. There is one really large one that cuts it through the west of the city. The city is a Victorian city. It was brick built in a boom industry of growth around, around linen shipbuilding, 1860s to 90s. Not very well planned city in that sense. That's almost part of what happened to the city that I'm going to show you is the seeds of its destruction. In a sense, we're maybe about the weakness of its city plan, which grew too quickly. Um, come the post-war stagnation, the city was already 50 years into stagnation, really, um, by 1956. Uh, it, it had a brief boom during the Second World War, but went back into stagnation uh, that really had run for a long time. So the housing stock was really poor, and yellow was the kind of housing redesignation areas in 1956. Those were never addressed, though, at that time. So unlike the rest of the UK, we didn't really have the planning and the, the housing projects that you would people in the UK would be familiar with through war damage from the Second World War. Belfast was also quite heavily damaged in the Second World War, uh, and because it was quite an unprotected city that wasn't expecting an attack, the Second World War bombing by the Luftwaffe actually had quite a big impact uh, on terms of fire damage and loss of fabric. But these areas were, these areas that are outlined were sort of Victorian poor housing that had been thrown up very quickly in and around the city centre. Then there's a plan for a motorway in 1962. It doesn't get published until 1969, which is quite late in UK terms. It doesn't really start to get built until the 1980s, but that's a regional roads department plan. And it wasn't really the city governance. It's an important thing to remember. And I should remember to, to give you some facts about governance of the city in the sense that the city has not really been in control of its own destiny since about 1972, when a lot of powers were taken away from cities and, and local authorities and put into central Northern Ireland governance. So that is a big theme in most areas of Northern Ireland is that there's a kind of lack of local ability to control your physical space and identity. It's a lot of regional uh, government departments, which ended up in quite a siloed governance during the conflict. So one way of dealing with the conflict was to do a very managerial government direct rule system from London um, from 1972. And that put government into silos, which kind of identified problems, solved them, but didn't really cross cut in any way. So what you're getting there in the early 70s, in the midst of a conflict, what you've actually got is a motorway being built through the city. And it's almost always forgotten in the histories of Belfast that the biggest impact, all of this damage is not war damage, it's not bombs, that's clearance of housing to build a motorway. And the city as it was in the 50s, so I'm just going to go, go through a series of maps quite quickly. There's a map that we as a group of architects and planners did about 10 years ago. Um, we called it the Missing City Map because for the first time we actually started to methodically map where were the vacant sites and we tried to identify who owned them as well and, and why they were caused. But just the simple thing of, of pulling all that red space together, it's almost as big as the city core itself. The amount of empty space within a 10 minute walk of the city center core, which you can kind of identify by its density. Um, that was the area we chose to map. We then started to study why that was occurring and we, we came up with this idea of the gray donut as a terminology to identify the road that was built on the west and north of the city and a large shatter zone towards the east as well. Inner ring roads, so there was a ring road and then a motorway built a few hundred meters apart. So it's almost like a double cut through the city. You've got the city core and where people live in buff tongue and institutions and schools, industrial areas in white. So that's kind of left the zones it includes some buildings that will probably get lost in the process or some buildings that will kept. But the actual, if you start to map the zones of change or the zones of blight, these are very hard areas to walk through. So it really means that the city core of Belfast has been quite isolated. L largely, of course, there was a bombing campaign, especially in the city centre. A lot of those buildings would have been rebuilt with insurance and so on. So the ragged age that you're getting is, is as much to do with road rebuilding as it was to do with bomb damage. and. Uh, and fire damage. So looking at that in this way, which is just to look at the road networks, you start to see the change over 30 years. So effectively, you can see the motorway, but start to look into each neighborhood and you realize that 
<clears throat> all the housing is built and built as a kind of cul-de-sac form. So there's multiple layers and depths of separation being inbuilt into the city. And all of that was built through the 70s, 80s, and 90s with quite a lot of, quite a large amount of public money. So kind of on like other conflicts, there was quite a large amount of money being spent to build that during a conflict. Um, and part of that is down to that kind of late addressing of housing. So what, what, one of the causes of the conflict was poor housing conditions. So it should be remembered that, you know, up until 1970, 72, three, there were still people living in 19th century houses without toilets in Belfast. It was described as the worst housing conditions in Europe at the time by far, uh, because it simply hadn't been addressed for three or four decades. Um, streets become degraded as kind of traffic corridors. You're turning into a more Americanized idea about a city around cars and car use, motorways through the city, you get lower housing density in the rebuilding. You have more class and religious separation. So people, and the other interesting thing is that people weren't shifted. The, the 1950s plan was maybe a gentrification plan and the notion that those working class communities would be pushed out of the city. But in the end, the conflict in a way saved them because those communities and neighborhoods, there was a, a recognition that the housing should be rebuilt. So it was rebuilt in poor form, uh, but they stayed where they were. So you do get more social class and religious separation. Um, local businesses tend to disappear in that process of rebuilding and then population drops in services. So I think these are all issues that many cities face. Severance from the city core. Figure ground maps of North Belfast. So you start to see a huge amount of change there. The nature of that road coming through, this is called the West Link. <clears throat> the fact that the land beside the road is owned by three different agencies doesn't help coordination. You can see the, the roads department never cleaned their land. The council cleaned their path quite well and the housing executive cut their grass quite well. Housing executive is a housing agency in the city. <clears throat> then coming back, I mean, one of the things for me was that I was never, never really taught any of this in university in Belfast when I was being taught in the late 80s and early 90s. But from the, the early 90s onwards, they're starting to become a, a, an uncontrolled speculation. Even at the end of the, the troubles period or the conflict period, there was still quite a lot of speculation going on in the 90s. It really took off into the 2000s, but it, it's left a very ragged city, <clears throat> a city that used to have quite a lot of beautiful Victorian building, buildings, which you can see. Generally, what happened was that good old buildings, which could have been saved, were knocked down to build some rather ugly new buildings. So as an architect, I suppose I was initially bewildered when I came back to Belfast because I was sort of thinking, where has all this development come from? What is the plan? Who's got the plan? And why are all these really bad architects doing it? And uh, I never really got the answer to any of those questions. So there has been a lack of a city plan. We're still dating with a city plan that's almost 50 years old now in terms of its status. But what you started to see was this going on, you know, car centre development with car parks at ground level. These apartments, I think there's going to be another photograph. Their glass balconies are on the other side. <clears throat> Large area, the working class areas that surround the city core are just repositories for commuters' cars. So there's quite a lot of commuter population. Crossing the West Link as a pedestrian, there's no pedestrian lights put up up until 10 years ago. So you literally had to sort of look and guess when you had to cross the road because there was no, no pedestrian crossing at that point. We're still building, even just today, there's been a big announcement about the final linking of the three motorways at this point. Uh, and the, the red streets are the existing original streets of the photograph that actually I showed you earlier on that was demolished, called Cedar Town. It's a wonderful part of the city in terms of there's a little community that, that, that managed to survive and rebuild. And it's right beside the docks. It used to be the most vibrant part of the city. Um, this inner ring road against the original housing, you can sort of see the, the ring road is also empty quite a lot of the time because it was built to deal with commuters. The motorway is between us and that church. This is a community that's actually been separated from, by, from its church by um, a motorway and then a series of car parks. So it's a kind of mundane. I think the other thing is that roads, I think, have often been used as separators in cities because they are seemingly normal and they are seemingly mundane and ordinary things that people think, well, that's just a road. But in the 1970s, government minutes did confirm that this was a deliberate plan in the 70s to actually create a call on sanitaire to separate West and North Belfast, which were the most troublesome areas, and also the poorer areas of the city. <clears throat> That's the West Link again. 
Davis Tower, famously on the left, had a helicopter pad on the top. The British Army were on the helicopter pad on the top of the building while people were living in it. And there used to be a large estate there called the Divis Estate of six story concrete blocks beside the motorway that was knocked down after about 20 years. The beautiful Cave Hill you can see in the background and you can see a back to front motorway sign. So it's this idea that the city streets die as they come to the motorway. Even the train station, this is the train, the main train station is closed off to one community. So that none of these are peace walls, by the way. All those walls that you're looking at, all those fences have nothing to do with separating the Catholic and Protestant population that is well known in the city. That's the other side of that development. You can see kind of quite close to the city center, but then the site on the left still empty. Late 90s, big shopping center built with a car park facing the ring road and facing one side of the city. So you back to front buildings were very common. Back to front housing was common in the 70s and 80s. A large amount of estates were built in cul de sac form and they're very defensive planning. So they face inwards into cul de sacs, which have nominally 20 houses around a safe neighborhood, open doors policy. But the outside experience of those estates then becomes a series of cul de sacs and walls. And there's 350 of those back to front streets around the city core within 10 minute walk. So you do have a, a city that's also like a donut. Um, the issue that doesn't get talked about much in Belfast is the, the extreme separation between class. The, the rich south and west, east, sorry, east of the city, outer east, are the, the most affluent areas, areas of the city. The inner city has neighborhoods which are uniformly almost all areas of high deprivation or poverty. And they alternate between Catholic and Protestant as you go around the city centre. So the kind of divisions are there in the sectarian sense, but the biggest division in the city, as you can almost see by the road network there, the motorway going out to the bottom of the screen on the left, defines the poorer areas of West Belfast cut off from South Belfast, which is the most affluent area of the city. Um, so the road really did end up cementing and, and causing and defining where the city was divided on its kind of uh, axis of and the other thing that's been talked about is the success. I mean, in most of the newspaper articles and talk that you'll hear about Belfast is its success and change the success of the peace process. But ultimately, it's created what's called a twin speed city. You know, there is a very poor city that is quite big going on the side and separated from quite an affluent city that's getting on quite well and does have high levels of affluence. And because Belfast is a cheaper city to live, People can't afford to live here, and the affluent are then much more affluent in that sense as well. <clears throat> I've called this the battle of master plans. Right? We've had any number of master plans and planning processes by different authorities. We still have a very fractured governance. The city council still doesn't have full planning powers, doesn't have full powers over the direction of the city. So this is what I used to call the neoliberal axis. This was the kind of desire line between a city centre and the Titanic and the harbour, which is muted as kind of new office development and the university in the south, which is affluent. So this was a plan which denied anything to do with the structure of the city, but saw it as uh, the regeneration axis, even though it had no physical or walking or spatial form. Uh, it, it really just connected up the desire lines of where speculation was to happen. And the same, another document from government, you know, it looks at the arterial routes where most communities are based in and around the city core, where very few people live, by the way. Um, very few people live in the center of Belfast. Then you've got the ring of roads, then you've got a ring of poor areas, and most people live in the periphery. And this really embeds car use as well. Um, but that's like one of those maps of East and West Berlin where each denied its existence in a sense. You know, the center isn't even drawn. And it's also this idea that there's just arterial routes and it's not about crossing through the, the city. It's always about getting into the city center and going out again. And that's very much everybody's experience of using the city core as a utility in a sense. So what started in the 50s, that's a map of time on the bottom there, 50s, 60s, 70s. It started off with housing stagnation, a failure to address that problem for a very long time. Then comes the conflict and housing crisis because a lot of people were burnt out of their homes and houses in, in August 1969. The conflict starts with people being burnt out of their houses and intercommunal conflict. Um, that creates a, a really big housing crisis. And then there starts to be a systematic building of in some ways, relatively good quality physical housing, but it's in a very flawed urban form and it goes on for two decades. 
And then you have a road or transport change from trams and a very connected city with we had into the car before the city really needed it. And then we get a technocratic solution in the 60s around the road. That road plan has persisted unquestioned in the city all the way through. It starts to be used in a security manner, but then once people get used to it, and once they get used to a segregated city and the bubble of the car during the conflict, it becomes the normalcy of the car, whereas people in Northern Ireland and Belfast simply won't question the idea that the city is so car-centric and you know really bad air quality. Again, some of the worst air quality in Europe happens in Belfast at times. And then you have the neoliberal speculation. So I sort of view the city as a series of waves or layers. The, you know, the, the negative impact of the car has ended up being implemented for four or five different reasons. Now it'll be implemented on the basis of growing the economy. So the, the narrative changes all the time, but it's the same road um, and we're still building it. So this was some work from the Foreign Filter in Belfast, most of that. And, when we got to the end of our four or five year period, we sort of said, look, you know, you need to make a decision about what way you want the city to work. The current city is kind of broken. It's got isolated communities well separated from the core. And, you know, how do we create a, a stitch city? So we started to produce community plans over a series of four years. We worked in quite a lot of depth with all the different communities. And we came up with what essentially became a master plan from the city that hasn't really gained much traction, unfortunately. There is no master plan for the city, by the way. So, you know, we were producing one in a vacuum, but it was about that issue of trying to restitch the city in some way and just repair. Um, and more and more, we tend to come to repair. I think this is my last slide. So, reflections, I suppose, I will start about the last one. I mean, one of my experiences as an architect is I wasn't really taught about the city properly. Uh, it, there was a Architects really pitting their, uh, burying their heads in the sand during the conflict. They didn't want to look at the issues. They didn't want to look at the city and university departments of architecture and planning didn't really teach the city. So when it came to the peace process, that's a nice cream van. Um, when it came to the peace process, we weren't ready. We weren't ready for the wave of speculation and normal global forces of development going on in cities through the 90s and noughties that happened in many cities. So we weren't ready for that. We didn't have a good analysis. We didn't have a plan. And I think that's maybe interesting for you know your school to think about. And then the mundane problems, the, the issues that people have now are all about mundane problems not being solved. So much after bright, shiny new things, and then working off from the bottom conflict. In a way, the conflict really distracted the citizens' attention. A lot of people moved out of Belfast. It lost about a third of its population. It lost a middle class to some extent. And there was a withdrawal from the, the civic realm. People did exist in the bubble of the car. They were afraid to walk around the city at night and so on. So th the conflict had these sort of side, up, you know, sideways or lateral effects. They, they weren't always just the direct physical. It was a kind of pulling away of attention from the civic in the city, which means that nobody was then resisting the roads or the agenda, and nobody was questioning that. And then really the result has been to turn up the contrast in the city so that the social difference or difference between affluence and poverty has almost got worse in peace times. And I think that's a common theme. Um, and we're running now as a twin city, which runs in twin narratives. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Mark. So now we'll move to Lviv, to Daria and Irena. But may I also introduce top right, Oleg Drozdov. Oleg is the founder of the Kharkiv School and is also um, a founder of Roskvit. And Oleg, I know that you have recently locked horns with some of the external actors who are looking at the development of Kharkiv, and I'm sure we'll return to that quite soon. Um, Daria yeah. Nirena. Thank you, Robert, for invent. Um, thank you. Um, and again, I would like to introduce myself maybe a bit more and Irina also before our presentation. And I am Daria Jehanova. I'm the BA program director of Kharkiv School of Architecture on the one hand. And on the other hand, I'm a lecturer there. 
And at the same time, and I'm an architect, a practicing architect with my practice on pause due to war. And what surprised me the most during last months of war is actually how teachers, students, and the team united while evacuating the school to live. And also what surprised me most was how students perceived their part in the in the school, their education as a kind of the front line in which they can take part. And listening to all the presentations today, uh, we understand that in the constantly changing environment due to the war, we are not able to make any analysis still because the situation changes every day. And the only practical thing that we can actually do at the moment is stick to the education path in order to analyze the surrounding and in order to educate the future generation of architects who will be responsible for the images of Ukrainian cities. So about these experiments on the curriculum and uh, our mission with educating architects, our presentation will be today. So very, very briefly, I introduce myself uh, as uh, Robert already told that I'm historian and uh, Kharkiv was always in focus on my interest because it's uh, um, extremely interesting and extraordinary city. Um, so, and uh, originally I am from Lviv, I am Lvivian. So, and this is the story, uh, I belong to two different cities, cities so from different parts of, uh, of Ukraine, Borderland city, Lviv on the western border and Kharkiv on eastern eastern border. And uh, when I was invited to uh, to school to, to join the Kharkiv School of Architecture, I was very happy to be part of the team. And not only as a manager, but also as a research and teacher. And uh, together with the students, we research Kharkiv from the perspective of memory and heritage. Uh, so and we thought about I thought as a teacher about uh, this links uh, about this very very different uh, city which actually has a lot in common but I I would never um, expect uh, that I will add to this uh, um, my um, teaching uh, perspective and approaches of uh, um, identity, memory, and heritage. One more aspect is trauma. So, and uh, um, now we have this uh, this focus and to try to approach this very challenging topic topic for us as Kharkiv as a, a um, city in the in the conflict. Um, so, so let's uh, let's start briefly from the very from the very beginning because it's very important point for us. Uh, so, as you already understood from my uh, intro, that idea of the school appeared at the um, uh, after the revolution of dignity, and it referred to the uh, changing context of the city and uh, uh, the search of for the new identity of the city. The Kharkiv School of Architecture was founded in 2017 uh, with the mission to shape and to advocate the values of open society and participatory culture, with the mission to build the community of young experts, uh, architects, and urbanists who are ready to take respons responsibility for their actions and to change uh, in the Ukrainian cities. Uh, the school has become the place of changes, uh, changes and in the same time the conductor of uh, changes in the city. Uh, Russian full-scale invasion of Ukraine forced us to evacuate school to Lviv um, 
one of the most uh, uh, safest uh, uh, city in Ukraine now close to the Polish border. From the, the from the very very first day of the war, we have felt the strong support of um, um, international uh, foreign architecture school and institutions and officers. Uh, uh, which uh, prove that the school is uh, part of uh, the international architecture milieus and network. And we are very grateful for their offering to host uh, our tutors and our students. Uh, but we had to think uh, in the long-term perspective. And this long-term perspective for us is teaching, uh, educating young generation of architects who will stay, who stay and who will stay in Ukraine and who will create our post-war future. We have all voiced our statement uh, on the second um, week of the, uh, of the war that uh, it's our responsibility to stay in Ukraine and it's our mission to provide high standard uh, architecture education and become a platform for communication and the dialogue uh, between local and international um, ex uh, experts aimed at uh, rethinking and uh, recovering Kharkiv and uh, other destroyed uh, uh, cities after the war. Our conviction that we have taken the uh, right decision grows uh, when massive brain uh, rain uh, started from Ukraine. So brain, brain rain risk uh, um, depleting Ukrainians' uh, vital skills and knowledge um, that are essential for its uh, physical rebuilding and for rebuilding uh, of our future. It is crucial that we accumulate and uh, uh, nurture the intellectual potential within Ukraine itself, itself. And this is the key part of the school's missions. Uh, the war has uh, gravely uh, affected uh, higher education in Ukraine. It uh, froze in universities uh, from the uh, first months of the war. It displaced uh, university, uh, universities from occupied uh, territories, uh, forced universities to come back to online training and pushed the best uh, students and faculty abroad. But the most challenging problem of higher education in, U in Ukraine is that uh, the reconstruction discussion and plans, both local and international, doesn't address the importance of high standard, standard of education for reconstruction. And education is the basic uh, for the reconstruction pyramid. And there is a direct uh, correlation between the understanding of local and international institutions of the need to invest uh, in education during the war and the rest and the result of reconstruction that we will see and we will analyze in five or 10 years after the war. And now in the time of war, education is our key humanitarian ads to support ourselves in the long-term perspective. And our mission and frontline is to stay in Ukraine and continue our work educating this future generation of architects responsible for the future rebuilding of Ukrainian cities. And good education is always based on values. We formulated our values of the school before the war started, uh, and right after the war started, we discussed them again and decided to change nothing. Uh, they appeared to be completely up to date. And guided by these values, among which are sensibility and respect, we had no room for inaction and couldn't but rethink the educational program in order to face the challenges of war and the post-war period. We understand sensibility as the ability to sense, feel, or perceive the context of the climate, society, culture, traditions, and the challenges of today. Sensibility enables posing questions and searching for understanding. It nurtures critical thinking and humanism. As architects, we are responsible to society and the environment. We are aware of the consequences of our actions, both in academic and professional work. Openness helps to set an ongoing dialogue with each other and society that builds trust. 
we practice and uh, we practice the principles of transparency and mutual respect, both in academic community and beyond. And keeping that in mind, there is no room for inaction. And the BA program of ours has acquired new meanings and focuses. But how to softly introduce and spread topics of heritage, memory, and post-war uh, studies and not traumatize students who live and learn in the country that is in state of war? The themes of reconstruction, memory, and heritage are complex enough for the undergraduate students. However, the challenge of introducing these topics not only to the MA program, but also to BA, is crucial to face, as the clear vision of the surrounding context and its complexity is a vital ability for, in the, for the architect in his new role of a mediator of processes in the city. However, post-war studies might be a complicated topic for those studying. Therefore, every issue that is related to war can be potentially traumatic on the one hand, but on the other hand, we can't but introduce new focuses. Otherwise, the feeling of irrelevance of the knowledge might come to light. And referring to that balance, most of the topics considering post-war studies, adaptive reuse and reconstruction, as well as critical heritage studies and memory are introduced on the third course of the BA program. Here you can see some projects of our foundation year students on their studio that were developed right after the war started and we decided to um, rethink our program right at the moment. And these are some searches and try and when students try to understand and to analyze the phenomenon of home basing on their own experience of being evacuated and trying to research and reflect on this experience and find the solution for this home that is always with you. This is also an example of our work during uh, this months of war and referring to the topics of refugees and uh, emplacement. And this is a workshop that was uh, developed together with the University of Liverpool, the University of Sheffield and KTH, when students from different countries, uh, among which was, was Ukraine, tried to search for an answer on how to make European and not only European cities more welcoming for refugees and displaced people. The new role of an architect as a mediator of different processes in the city, not only as a creator, is crucial uh, for Ukraine at the moment. And while moderating the processes, the architect brings together the humanitarian and the technical, the practical and the theoretical. A combination of independent expression and social responsibility creates a canvas for the work with society and the environment, which the architect uses throughout the practice. Educating this new type of an architect becomes crucial to Ukraine as not the question of what exactly to reconstruct or rebuild is important, but how to organize these processes, taking into account different actors in the society that is traumatized. How to make these processes horizontal and humane? How to not colonize ourselves again? How pre-war problems affect post-war rebuilding and how to deal with it? And here you can see also a third year project of Maria Suprun, who is in the hall tonight representing the school. And this is a project that was developed for the uh, Severodonetsk that is experiencing huge ruination at the moment and in the first months of war. So thank you very much. Thank you, Daria. Thank you, Irina. And thank you, Oleg, for being there as a presence. Um, Robert, you have the challenging task of responding. Very difficult task of trying to respond myself. Um, let me know if you can hear me speaking properly. I'm quite eager. But um, I, what I thought came across there were, well, there were lots of commonalities. Two of the main ones were obviously segregation and war as a kind of Jim Crow. Jim Crow with the laws in the US separating black from white. 
and um, spatial segregation, including the use of infrastructure to, to, to divide and to other. Um, and we were seeing that in Belfast, we saw it in Beirut, we were seeing it in, uh, in Bosnia and elsewhere. Um, and also the question of displacement, people leaving and then who comes home? Is it the same people coming home? Um, or do they have the same values? Um, and, I, I, and, that, and, and also the things that happen within the fog of war that aren't actually directly about fighting, but are cover for um, neoliberal interventions, either during the war itself or afterwards um, in the reconstruction phase. Um, I thought Heber's uh, discussion of Solidaire's uh, uh, um, sort of metastatization of, of Beirut was interesting because we think of the idea of pseudo space, the sort of public space, it's actually private space uh, masquerading as a kind of Anglo property world phenomenon, sort of Paternoster Square or Times Square in New York, but we're seeing it other places too, where and that's uh, one of the risks of post-war redevelopment vultures. Who has the money? And the risks go way beyond the destruction itself, um, as I think Mark showed really interestingly. Um, the the quotidian, quotidian the, the, the traffic engineering, the huge problems that have been caused, where, where the issue is not so much sectarianism as um, class and market speculation. Um, and um, that happens as well as we saw with the presentation from Sarajevo and Bosnia, changing populations, displacement, who returns, what are, what's the balance of the community, who gets to make the decisions. Um, and uh, I think the violence of war can blind us to the, the, the purpose that sect sectarianism can serve. We should sometimes see it as a symptom rather than a cause. And the real issue is differentials in power, vertical differentials in power. Um, and that is true in, in, in many instances um, where um, the presenting issue might be ethno-nationalist, but really it's who's pulling the strings, who's creating the divisions, who has the power and the money. Um, that, and so I've got a few sort of issues I'll raise thinking about construction per se. Um, one of the things is that all this is a reminder that culture and architecture is often contested because it's so linked to identity. And there's an inevitable overlap between physical fighting and ideological culture wars. Um, but, and sometimes they nest inside each other. So before reconstructing, we have to ask ourselves some related questions. Um, the first is, what caused the destruction? What pattern did it follow? And crucially, what was the intent? Was it just collateral damage or a military necessity? Was it wanton destruct destruction with a disregard for civilian conditions of life, such as carpet bombing? Or was it actual targeting of places of culture, hospitals, education, or herbicide, where the targeting is the city as a whole, or the notion of a cosmopolitan city? Or was it targeting as a part of a pattern of in, that had an intent of cultural cleansing or cultural genocide. This happens regularly. You know, in, in, in the region we're discussing tonight, the Crimean Tartars under Stalin, then Arab East Jerusalem, the Bosnia's Muslims, was the, or I indeed um, uh, uh, the, uh, the ratchet effect of the, of the arson attacks in, in Belfast that divided communities in the late 1960s. Was the destruction part of an attempt to erase a group or divide a group or, and, or was it to, to deracinate through culture side, destroying sites of language, religious sites, museums, even vernacular housing we saw destroyed in, in, in uh, Bosnia, uh, an attempt to er eradicate o Ottoman vernacular architecture. Um, and the, the purpose of all this is to remove somebody's right to a place in the past as well as in the future. Um, and, the, and in this, we also need to distinguish between true ethno-nationalist divisions and conflicts and false othering that we just stirred up by political elites. Um, 
Neither cultural cleansing or cultural genocide are actually crimes under international law. And there are good reasons for that, well, bad reasons for that. Um, it's not, they're not codified. And the Genocide Convention only relates to bodily matters, not to culture. Or, um, and that has um, uh, consequences uh, when decisions are being made about reconstruction as well, because the, uh, or when we're trying to track the pattern and, and the meaning, the, the intent behind destruction. Um, and if we can determine that the, the pattern of destruction was an intent to, to, for cultural cleansing or ethnic cleansing or genocide, then I think the case for reconstructing what was lost in the face of attempted genocide heirs is an act of resistance to that genocide. And we saw that uh, famously, say, in uh, Warsaw, where the Poles uh, um, um, rapidly and steadily rebuilt the old city um, in the face of a Nazi attempt at the eradication of Slavic culture. Not, not unproblematically, actually, um, but, but, but that's the, a kind of ju a justification in that specific cir circumstance. Um, another issue that wants to rise is who is the reconstruction for? Um, destruction means the changing of identity of places and the people living there after a conflict can be very different. Entire peoples can be displaced. Refugees come in from elsewhere, internally displaced people. Uh, we saw that in some of the presentations tonight. Um, and so, you know, do you reconstruct for the post-war population, or do you reconstruct even if that post-war reconfiguring is the result of um, ethnic cleansing? Is that accepted? Do you try to remodel the demo um, demographics in some way? Uh, I mean, I think this will be an issue for Ukraine's eastern and southern promises. What will the ethnic and national makeup of the population be? Is the aim for these areas of the Ukraine in the future to be cosmopolitan, multi-ethnic, including Russians and Russian speakers? Or do we accept the permanent divisions of war? Um, and we can see it in cities like Mosul in Iraq, where, which is now being reconstructed with, um, I mean, it was heavily destroyed when it, in the name of li its liberation. A lot of what survived historically has been is being destroyed in the name of multinational development, and its multicultural component, the Yazidis, the Christians, who who made up sections of its population, have gone. It's now much more monocultural. So, who is it being reconstructed for, and who is making the decisions? Um, and so, the sort of the meaning of that reconstruction beyond the pure, purely pragmatic, is it resisting genocide? Is it resisting uh, this side? Um, who's paying for it? People like President Erdogan and Assad have both dressed up reconstruction after war as regeneration, which is essentially regeneration as repression in, in Kurdish areas, for instance. Or there is re, uh, reconstruction where the aim is to forget, to pretend the war never happened. and. An example of that is Munich, which was the capital of the of the of Nazi Germany, the, 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 and has been restored, facade deep as a as the pre-Hitlerian city, as if the war never happened, and the responsibility is never on display. Um, Dresden and other cities are now doing the same thing after much delay, reconstructing a faux baroque city centre, a project that has links to the nationalist and far right and is an intensely ideological project as it is in other, as other reconstruction projects are, particularly after war. Um, and I think one thing in terms of education, one thing we need to educate our architects with is to be aware of architectural determinism, uh, not just attempting to build utopias or to test out our architectural models or um, to correct the mistakes of the past. We need to know the limits of the architectural. Architects are not the engineers of human souls. We cannot transform society in a determinist manner through architecture. It's an illusion. 
It's people who transform society, and architecture and other professionals can help or hinder that transformation, but it doesn't lead it. Um, another issue is the myth that reconstruction, especially of heritage, brings reconciliation. That's not always or even often true, and it's certainly not evidenced anywhere I can think of. Um, Mostar, for example, in Bosnia, remains as divided as ever, despite the reconstruction of Mostar Bridge by UNESCO and the World, World Bank. And there's a, it's instantly declared a World Heritage Site as, 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 a, as if it was an historic place when it's actually almost entirely new. This gives the uh, illusion of reconciliation in a city that's um, still entirely, well, largely divided, still has two schools under one roof, still has, as, as we heard, massive um, emigration by young people who are sick of it. Um, so architecture can't bring about reconciliation, heritage can't, and uh, only people can do that. Although, as we've seen, in we architecture or engineering can hinder it through, let's say, the infrastructure of Belfast. And uh, just th also think about the, on the, there's a lot of memory is a word used a lot in these kind of contexts. And it's a word I've used a lot <laughs> myself in, in previous books, but I've become increasingly wary of the use of memory as opposed to the use of history and facts. It's an, it's an unreliable concept. Um, and collective memory is simply a metaphor, and we need to remember that too. It's not a real thing. And so memory is, has become kind of a jargon about dealing with these situations when really we need to be clear about what's true and what's not, not just what the people feel to be true. Um, and I suppose finally, before we do any reconstruction, we need to gather the evidence Organisations like Forensic Architecture have shown that architecture can be witness to crimes. It's the material evidence of wrongdoing, of the culpability for war crimes, of genocidal patterns of destruction. And yes, there's a pragmatic need to build back homes and facilities, but we shouldn't eradicate these evidential traces. They tell the truth, and there can be no reconciliation without truth-telling. And finally, if we forget the consequences of war, as Heber discussed, uh, if we reconstruct in a way that conceals its horrors, then are we more likely to consider military options in the future? And so reconstruction should also be always be critical reconstruction. Some scars should remain. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> We have, a, we have a few minutes left, and, and what I'd really like to do is to prioritize uh, questions from you, and particularly from Ukrainian colleagues who are in the audience. So if I could, if I could ask the speakers to come and um, sit on the stage. I'm not sure how this works with our Ukrainian colleagues behind us, but it will work. And Maria, would you please come and... Maria is the author of that wonderful project that you saw, so she's a... Somebody who's going to enter the fourth year at Kharkiv School. So if I may, I'd just like to ask one question because it's sort of burning in my mind. And I, I suppose I'd like to direct it at um, Daria and Irina, but also to Oleg. Um, wars yet to come. There was an extraordinary theme running through the evening around the sense that you could embed within the process of reconciliation, reconstruction, deep tensions. It was the tale of solidaire. It was the dysfunctional nature of the Dayton peace agreement. It was the sort of weaponization of road planning in West Belfast and Belfast generally. And I suppose I'd really like to ask Oleg particularly, um, there has been a strong resistance to the sort of reconstruction that happened in Beirut with Solidaire. The Kharkiv is subject to a lot of interest in terms of international reconstruction. And you've been very particular in resisting that. And I would just like you to say something about why are you resisting 
an influx of foreign support and foreign enthusiasm and foreign aid? And what is it that you're trying to preserve by resisting that? Um, thank you, Robert, for your question. Uh, yeah, it's very important. Uh, because the war emphasized a, a border between our uh, post-Soviet past and, era, and some uh, new era, which we have to do our whole work and, and, uh, and shape our, our dream. And maybe for architects also very important to introduce this um, shape of the dream to uh, society and, and also to, to reshape it again. It means in, 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 in state of war, uh, we, uh, we develop enormously our civic society, but, uh, but also mostly people are busy in different kind of voluntary activities. It means they're not really ready to join uh, this uh, work for, uh, for um, making brief of the future, but also very important maybe when you fight uh, uh, to know which for which kind of wife do you need uh, to fight? Which kind of wife do you uh, imagine behind this war? And uh, also this, I, I mean, uh, a most important process is rebuilding community. It's uh, to, uh, to build a, a new type of relation. And, and also there's a capacity building of uh, um, decision makers of a of, of, of big group of uh, society which could be people who could be active in the process of rebuilding. It's one of the base for any transformation or for any rebuilding for, for any future scenario. That's why it's important uh, to create a, this a software before we start to design. Last question, Daria. You, I mean, the um, curriculum that you've invented is inspiring and incredibly carefully um, formed. But you know, how do you explain to people in urgent need of support that they should re resist the intervention of foreign actors and, and participate in much slower, more culturally based, more nuanced forms? of participation and design? Uh, well, personally, I believe uh, in education on the first place, for sure. Um, and I think that, yes, that might be a very long way. And I guess that the main mistake that can be made and the biggest mistake that can be made right after the war ends is to act too quickly. Because for sure there will be some urgent problems and urgent needs that might be fixed. But if we have an opportunity to take some more time for analyzing and for building um, democratic and horizontal processes in decision-making, that is worth fighting, I guess, and talking to people and uh, trying to explain why this is important, educating them, it is, I think, a vital thing uh, in the rebuilding process. And thereby, for example, in Kharkiv School of Architecture, not only an educational program for uh, bachelors or masters we have, but we also have a public program which is completely open to anybody and it is also aimed to spread the knowledges and to highlight the problems and issues and the complexity of the context to the society, to citizens uh, from different domains, from di with different experiences and from different uh, parts of, of Ukraine. Thank you. I mean, Vanessa and Hiba, to different extent, you, you outlined processes that are in a sense, a, a warning um, in this process. I suppose, Vanessa, how, how long does it take before you know you failed in the process of 
reconciliation, reconstruction? What are the signs of failure? Um, well, so, well, uh, as, I, as I've shown tonight, Bosnia and Herzegovina has really failed. The, the government of Bosnia and Herzegovina has failed with the reconstruction process, reconciliation and return. But I think we've also been failed by the international community on that front. And I think the signs, which is maybe an interesting point, because you've put me on the spot here, and I purposefully put, used the word, um, explained that Srebrenica was a UN safe zone during the genocide of 1995. So I think that actually um, what's interesting to think about is that you, there is maybe a way to look at it that you failed before you started. Because you, you are, or, or lo the local population is expected to trust politicians and international community immediately after war. But they were the, the same ones who let them down during the war. So actually, I think that, and this is, this is interesting. I, I find it interesting when I hear the Harkiv school talking about um, colonialization through reconstruction, because th th this is kind of very closely linked. So immediately is the answer. Thank you. And, and Hiba, how, how could Beirut have resisted the intervention of Solidaire? I don't know if there is a way to resist such a thing because I hear my Ukrainian colleagues about what they're saying, but when people are telling you, not the solidarity response, but when people are telling you we need houses right now, like we had the experience in post-2006 war with the reconstruction of southern suburbs of Beirut, like we need houses now. And then all the architecture and planner visions, they're like, let's take our time to rebuild differently, to think about light and air and tra trans uh, transports and stuff. And they're like, we don't, there's no time for this. We're just going to build it as it was or whatever. And so I, I think in some ways there's this question. The other question is the transfer of power in Lebanon. Similarly, in many ways, is that the same militias, we woke up one day, they told us the war ended, and they like just became the parliamentaries, the same people, you know, like they all killed so many people and now they are our politicians. And so I don't think from the beginning they had any capacity to do anything different. It just became war and other means with real estate and housing. And we're still suffering from that. I mean, now 70% of the population, 30 years after, 70% of the population is under poverty line and it's just more and more brain drained. So in some ways, we would like to say this is how it works or it worked maybe for other people who are suffering for this. But when, uh, when we had this earlier conversation, we realized 30 years after Bosnia, 30 years after Lebanon, 30 years after Belfast, we're still reeling and we're still wondering about what does it mean to have post-war if it exists, if a post-war situation exists. Yeah. So I don't, I don't have a clear answer to that. But we know we need to be wary of road engineers, <laughs> don't we? Yeah. Just don't, don't build roads. <laughs> it would be nice to throw it open to the audience, but Maria, you are experiencing this radical education in Kharkiv. What, what, what advice do you have for the school? Um, I guess the school um, took the right uh, path to... Um, because the uh, <laughs> it was really fun because the I mean not fun but after two weeks of the war there was a message that yeah we are starting again we are starting the semester because it was the after the 24th of February the semester already started so we uh, continued uh, studying and um, it was the force that actually kept us um, alive in a sense and. Uh, um, going and thinking about future, uh, our personal future and the future of the whole country, of the city and uh, citizens. So um, I guess the power of uh, uh, our community is really strong, the Kharkiv School of Architecture, but the communities in Kharkiv and Lviv that now are gathering and uh, engaging in different initiatives and uh, uh, the war showed the real power of Ukrainians and the power of uh, gathering together in the um, 
really hard times. So <laughs> I guess, uh, uh, yeah, we're on the right path and uh, just to be strong and to be um, kind of positive <laughs> on the, uh, about the future because, yeah, the world will end and we know this for sure and uh, the future is... Uh, the uh, good and right future is near. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Somebody, a question following Maria. Um, I think I'm doing this. <laughs> Could you say who you are when you, when you ask a question? I'd uh, just like to say thank you to everybody for speaking. Um, my name is Amrit Flora. I'm the MA course leader for interior and spatial design at uh, Camberwell, uh, UAL. Um, I just want to ask whether we're <coughs> partly teaching the wrong people. Um, in a sense, we're teaching architects, and architects have a history of thinking they know the answers, and we don't, uh, as, as we've been mentioning. Um, a lot of aid projects work successfully when they work on regulatory environments. So actually, perhaps what we should be doing is already dealing not necessarily with the communities, but with the regulatory, parliamentary, uh, town planners, getting the rules in place that will stop the developers or stop speculation so that we then have the space to come in and do things. I think uh, Mark mentioned that there were lots of different actors controlling different parts, and that's part of the problem. So if you do spend the next 12 months already designing new regulatory frameworks for how development happens in the future, that then gives you the space. Um, I don't know whether people have a, a view on that, that actually what you need to do is get those politicians inside your school, not think that the architects have the power to change any decisions. Thank you. Lucy, you teach a lot of people architecture. Are you teaching the wrong people? I'm also aware there's an awful lot of architects in power in Bosnia. Thanks. Give me that question. Thanks, Robert. Um, uh, I think we do need to expand the conversation. I think there is a silo culture within architecture where we all speak to each other, and that is problematic in terms of these other things um, and these wider conversations. And I do feel like, yes... I agree with your point that there is also very much a limit to our power in these conversations, and absolutely. So, yes, I think you're right. I also think that actually, for us, I think um, what we showed a bit today is also that the power we also have is being directly able to facilitate with communities and work with people on the ground in different ways, and we need a lot more of us to do that. I think one of the problems is that there aren't that many people doing that. So I think... You know, one of the things that would be interesting for the Hahiv School is thinking about, you know, challenging these big kind of um, nouveau colonial master plans and sort of actors that we're talking about, but also thinking about how you're training your students to go in on the ground into the communities they're from around Ukraine as well um, and actually help people on the ground in small scale as well as the large scale conversation. Thank you. Sorry, Venice, you can't answer that question. Um, is there another question from the floor? I'll, I'll take the lady at the back in red. It's closer to my colleague. Hi, um, my name is Asha Zyroshkowska. I work with Maria at Assemble. Uh, so great to see you on the stage, Maria. Um, so my question actually is maybe follows a little bit the, the question before, but in a slightly different way. So because obviously. Uh, reconstruction of, of places affected by destruction and atrocities can result in, in some of chaotic and forgetful planning, seeing um, how seeing in examples seen today or, or in some Eastern European countries, uh, uh, as for example in Poland, where I'm from, where, where it's, it's definitely not only up to architect to uh, reconstruct and redevelop a, a city, but uh, I would like to ask what if it what if it was? So in this ideal scenario, because obviously people adopt and adapt the city kind of organically, especially after um, it was like difficult events. Uh, but in um, an ideal scenario of reconstructing the city, what would be um, leading principles 
to, re to uh, do this redevelopment or, or even to start analysis and, and navigate um, these kind of complexities because it, it very often uh, comes to reclaiming identities that, that take decades. Um, yeah. who, who would you like to, to ask that question? That's, uh. a, that's a question we're all struggling with, I think. Who, who <laughs> I think maybe if, if uh, Daria and Irina could, yeah. and Oleg could uh, answer the question. Okay, I, I, I could, yeah. Uh, maybe with Irina also to share. Uh, uh, I think we turn, um, uh, turn it from um, in, in, in industrial centrical and uh, speculation driven city to humus centrical. And this is a um, yeah, point of uh, our uh, departure. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and, and, and we will build all this uh, system of values uh, around that. And, and this is, will be quite a, a, a difficult work uh, because uh, we have to uh, to change, uh, I don't know, a lot of layers around because they form for other, um, completely other goal, other idea around. And, and, and person, uh, human, uh, will be in the center of, I hope, uh, future Ukrainian city. Karina, please, maybe to add some. Um, so if we talk about about Ukraine, first of all, I think that uh, there is no uh, ideal scenario and uh, idealistic scenario, so and we should uh, um, be aware of, of, of this. Uh, um, uh, so for for Ukraine, we have a lot uh, of work uh, ahead. As for uh, for the last thirty years of independence, uh, there were no radical trans transformation and uh, reform in the city. So in the in the state of war now, we have uh, 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 double tasks uh, to. Um, Fulfill the reforms which need, which which should be the base for for their sustainable development, and also to to uh, react on the reconstruction, and also to react to react the global changes, uh, global global um, challenges um, for for the cities. So it's really complex. Uh, uh, tasks uh, uh, for us. I think that uh, the scenario we should think about scenario very precisely, uh, because any reconstruction um, take place in a, a certain place, in a certain political system, in certain cultural environment, in se in certain um, social, social social relations. So, and this scenario should be developed particularly for for every state and every um, every 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 city. So, the first of first of all, um, for Ukraine, it's very important uh, uh, to organize the uh, transparent process and involving different actors uh, in the. Uh, Process of reconstruction. It will be not so easy, easy as we are post-authoritarian country with very strong state, national, and local authorities. So they, for the time being, they have mostly the monopoly of decision making. So this is the first things should what should be done. The second what. Uh, Oleg already mentioned before is that the involvement of local com community in the discussion. And the third, third, third things I think that we should start as an intellectuals, not only architects and general humani humanitarians, to discuss very deeply and loudly in our community that uh, post reconstruction process uh, is really take times that. Uh, um, uh, um, short-term um, um, decision will not uh, end with the old good uh, good results so this is this is very uh, very important things um, and also also it's very also it's very important to learn from 
other experience and other cases because uh, we can learn uh, um, about the failures and we can learn about the um, good solution which we can which you can apply this is very important but look for and actually this is the way in which ukraine now goes and i think that it's wrong way we are looking for a good example good case we can apply to to our case and actually our school and our projects and what our teaching is about this it is about uh, critical thinking critical analysis and understanding that every case is uh, very uh, site site uh, specific thank you i'm going to ask you to answer a question in a second i'm being asked to stop so i'm afraid we don't have a time for another question from the floor. Um, I'd like you to end, Dalia, Elena, Maria, Oleg. You have a room full of people here who are here to support you, want to be helpful, want to do something useful in relation to the future of the school. Maybe you could just, in a couple of sentences, just say, how do we do that? How do we not get it wrong? How do we not tread on your toes? What is it that is most useful for us to do to support you? Maria. <laughs> they all looked very confused when I asked that question. You didn't. <laughs> Me too. So, um, <laughs> um, the amount of support I personally get is huge because my family is here. I have two sisters, uh, the smallest ones. And uh, uh, we went a huge way <laughs> from Ukraine to get here and to uh, get the support from uh, different people. And um, I guess this actually forms the, way, uh, the main way of supporting Ukrainians um, to look closer um, on your environment, even because I was trying to find people through other people, through other, other people, and... Uh, uh, forming the links that can um, help not only me but different people displaced from their uh, cities. And uh, um, I'm speaking more from the yes yeah, student that was uh, out of the Ukraine, uh, out of Ukraine from the uh, first days of war. So um, yeah, the help like that you can provide locally in your area even in your city is uh, immense and uh, for the school um, I guess it's mostly intellectual help and because uh, 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 as mentioned we have the public program and um, it would be really nice to um, invite more people with different experiences that like uh, the people that are gathered uh, here as well, as I heard so many uh, interesting um, projects on um, how to deal with post-war reconstruction and uh, yeah, I guess intellectually is one of the main uh, domains you can help in uh, for the school. Uh, thank you, thank you. Alia, Elena. Um, well, I agree with Maria completely that we have received a, a huge amount of support and of proposals for support during last months, and intellectual support in particular, and it is very important for us. And we try to implement all of these knowledges and try to localize them to Ukraine, Ukrainian context. But nevertheless, uh, unfortunately, being in the country that is in the state of war, we just experience the lack of hands to work with all this intellectual support also. So I guess, to my mind, the support might be the important support that we really need is to help us not to flee the country, to stay here in Lviv, to continue our work here in Ukraine and to gather our students here in Ukraine. Um, this is important, I guess. 
And it might be quite obvious, but I think that financial support is also quite important because this year we have uh, reduced tuition fee for our students as we are facing huge economical crisis, but we understand that education and especially architectural education must be affordable. Um, and at the same time, all of our donors are now focused on helping the army. So this is actually the great issue for us at the moment. And um, yeah, I guess that financial support is also very important for us now. To pay for the electricity that we do not have due to the rocket strikes. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe I would add uh, uh, that we are also looking for a long term uh, collaboration uh, and will be interesting to create, uh, to, to build uh, some long term relation with the uh, uh, British University and uh, focus uh, in, a, in a future. Um, academical and maybe not only academical project for rebuilding Ukraine. Okay. Irina, you get the last word in that respect. Okay. Uh, so what I can uh, can add, uh, we invite you to be our partner, to be our partner to strengthen uh, uh, our force as educators. Uh, who try to um, to give new knowledge and important knowledge for our students to rebuild, rebuild uh, Ukraine. And uh, your, support, your support in this time, in time of war, uh, is extremely important and we would uh, appreciate it very much. Thank you. I'd like to just draw things to a conclusion in a couple of ways, just to thank all of you Robert, Lucy, Vanes, Hiba, Maria, Mark, for sharing words of support, <coughs> words of warning, cautionary tales, but also very inspirational thoughts as well. Um, we've opened up so many conversations, and just a reminder that there is a commitment to carry on with these conversations in a series of events that look specifically at the cities that we've um, looked at today, but also then reflect that back on um, Kharkiv. Um, I think it's very important now just to not only thank you, but just to say in a heartfelt way that we're all thinking about you in Lviv. We're constantly um, concerned and just wanted to ask the audience to um, clap for the work that you're doing and to show their solidarity for your future. Finally, because we are shameless and Vera's just stood up, um, just a reminder that if there is practical support, even financial support, that we can raise on behalf of the school, please speak to Vera. So thank you so much for coming, and thanks everybody who's been involved and supported this event.